Hello, please let me see your ticket subs for the Double Edge Double Bill, where you get two film or media discussions for the price of one, which is nothing. Each week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to randomly select the yin and yang of a double feature. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fates for each episode. Let the chaos begin! I am Thomas Mariani. And I am Adam Thomas. And uh, welcome! This is our first episode of the Double Edge Double Bill. Um, Adam, are you excited? I, I can barely contain my glee. Oh god, yeah, those nipples are so. I know it's so. There's could cut glass with these nipples. <laughs> so dangerous. Um, <laughs> but I guess we should introduce ourselves a bit. Uh, we both like movies and media in general, and we've talked. Uh, about you know, before. not not me really. Yeah, no, not me really. <laughs> <laughs> I just roped you into this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but we we both uh, have talked before in other podcasts, and we decided to start one of our own, and that included a wider breadth of genre. Um, and I think what we also really wanted to do was really represent the good and bad side, because there are plenty of movie podcasts that talk about exclusively good movies, exclusively bad movies, but I think mm-hmm. it's important to always have a balance there, don't you agree? Absolutely, and to not pigeonhole yourself into one genre. Like, you know, we're going everywhere, all over the place with every type of movie, and I think that's, uh, I think it's kind of unique. Keep in mind, too, it's all subjective. This is our personal opinion on what we think is a good movie and what we think is a bad movie. I could very well pick a movie that I think is bad that you like and vice versa. And sometimes it can also be a thing of we've opened the table to movies that we've heard are good or movies that we've heard mm-hmm. are bad, maybe not have seen. So there's also right. that potential element that we could uh, have the entire script flipped by the end of when we actually discuss things. It's insane. But uh, why don't we actually get to the picking? here absolutely and the big incentive is that we will record a little intro where we each have either two good movies or two bad movies we'll trade off based around a topic this week it's interesting we're recording this not too long before infinity war comes out and also it'll be released around right before deadpool 2 comes out it, the marvel movies are everywhere especially over this summer so we are doing this theme around Marvel films, and uh, it's a wide breadth. Even within these adaptations of comic books, there are a lot of different genres to pick. Yeah, I just hope that the comic book genre movies like catch on. I just hope people start to go see them. They need more exposure. And I have um, two good Marvel movies that we'll pick from, and you have two bad ones. Yeah, 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 got two bad ones. Uh two really bad ones for you, so I'm excited to see which one you're going to pick. Yes. So, Adam, you are the first one to pick. Pick a number between 1 and 10. <gasps> oh! Uh, I will go number 6. Alright, number 6. That was closest to number 7, which is the original Iron Man, which started the Marvel Cinematic Universe stuff, though number 2 was Spider-Man 2 which is a great movie in its own right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that's one of the ones that gets forgotten about because, you know, Spider-Man's been done so many times. But no, yeah, those are great movies. I'm, Iron Man's awesome. I can yes. talk about Iron Man all day. And we will talk about that for at least half an hour when we do our discussion. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah sure. But now it's time for me to pick a couple from your couple of bad movies. Adam. Mm-hmm. So I will choose... Number seven. Number seven is closest to number nine, which is the complete shit show that is Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. And at number two, I had the Jennifer Garner shit show Electra. From my memory, I would say I got the slightly better movie out of those two. They're two bad movies, but uh, I, I think I'll be less bored with Ghost Rider than Electra. I mean, I can, maybe. I, <laughs> I might disagree with you there, but that's okay. That's okay. 
We can right. do that. Yes, and we will right after this break. No one's allowed to talk, is that it? You can't talk? No, you intimidate them. Good God, you're a woman. <laughs> is it better to be feared or respected? And I say, is it too much to ask for both? I humbly present the Jericho. To peace. And we are back, and we have seen both of the features that we just uh, ended up picking in, you know, the span of about 30 seconds for you guys, but it's been a couple days. So uh, now we're going to talk about our little Marvel double bill. And, uh, you know, before we get into that, I do want to ask, um, I, I go and put all the cards on the table here. Adam, you are a big comics person, right? Yes. Marvel specifically, or? Marvel growing up, and then, like, when Image came out, I got into that for a little bit, but it's always been back to Marvel. Right. Admittingly, I'm not as big of a comics person. What I have read has mostly been DC, more specifically Batman, because that's what everybody has fucking read in terms of goddamn comics. It's like, oh, I've read Batman. Um, it's because you're a poser, Thomas. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm a fake comics geek yeah. girl. That's, that's <laughs> what I am. Especially with the Marvel side of things, aside from, like, even as a kid... Honestly, the only Marvel character I really clung on to was Spider-Man. Because, once again, poser. That's like... Like, yeah, Batman yeah, and right. Spider-Man are, like, the two giant characters that everybody fucking knows about. Um, so, it was interesting, especially when the transition into our first film, Iron Man, came out. Really, I'd only been familiar with Marvel stuff through, like, the TV shows or the movies that came out. And the good movies that Marvel put out were the... At least the initial Spider-Man movies. Those were, like, the... Sort of big ones, along with, like, the X-Men movies as well, arguably. Um, yeah, and Blade. And Blade. Like Blade that, but... As a kid, I didn't watch Blade. Like, sort of, like, the big, mainstream, massive successes. It was really, like, the X-Men movies, Spider-Man. And that's it? Yeah, that's it. Because you had, like, attempts, like, Fantastic Four, or Punisher, oh. Daredevil. Uh, a lot of those that, some of them were more successful than others, but none of them really made as much of a cultural impact, except for, like I said, X-Men and Spider-Man. And then Marvel comes in, and uh, they take a pretty big risk. They take out a pretty large loan and form Marvel Entertainment Group Incorporated. And are like, hey, we're going to create a studio where our main thing is to create an actual universe and have creative control over our characters. And it's a pretty big risk. That's what everybody talks about in the ten years since this uh, mm -hmm. initial Iron Man movie came out. And it's, uh, to say, I think the risk paid off. Yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, I, yeah, I, I mean, they did all right. You know, it's still, we'll still see. We'll see how the, I, I heard this next one's going to bomb. I don't know, yeah, we're recording so, this right before yeah. Infinity War. I don't know, guys, it's uh, not tracking great. It's going to be a stinker, yeah. Uh, how can but it I, compare to I Feel Pretty? Everyone's still right. going to Amy Schumer's right. I Feel Pretty and yeah. Super Troopers no. too. No, uh, and you know, it was a huge risk, especially a huge risk leading off with a character like Iron Man, who, at his biggest, was you know, a high C to a B level character in the comic books. He was never their, one of their big guys. Their big guys were always the X-Men, Spider-Man and Captain America. So for them to lead off with Iron Man, I mean, what a huge gamble. And especially with who they got to play Iron Man and everything else it was big risk on their part. But man, I couldn't see it any other way now. Well, yeah, because really when you think about it, so what, where the series ends up going, for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it goes in like big cosmic territory, crazy shit, Guardians of the Galaxy. You have mm -hmm. to have a base. You have to have right. something basic that people can attach to. And in retrospect, really, Iron Man fits because it, on very basic paper terms, which I remember being bandied about when I was like, who the fuck is Iron Man? As like, you know, when this was right. coming out, all of my friends who knew comics were just like, think Batman, but he's not depressed. And he's a drunk. Yeah. And he's more of a drunk, yeah, uh, on that. And that's what, you know, I'm kind of like, oh, okay, that I can. that's a good elevator pitch. Especially. Yeah, I agree. And, and like you said, it's, it's grounded in some sense of reality that he's just a normal dude. Yeah, he's got a lot of money, but he doesn't have superpowers. Right, he doesn't come from anywhere big or cosmic or another planet or from the past, yeah. anything like that. It's, he is a rich dude who has access to a weapons company, that his father started, and he is now, like, a big major benefactor of. And we see him at the start of that here in the opening, uh, as played by Robert Downey Jr., who, as you mentioned, prior to the 2008, was kind of just known as, like, a fuck-up 
who was like really successful in the eighties, had was like a rising brat pack star, mm-hmm. and then went into deep addiction with drugs and alcohol and was kind of washed up. Around 2005 is where he started doing, I would say, his comeback with Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and also Zodiac. But the thing is, nobody saw those movies. Was Zodiac pre-Iron Man? It was a year before. Holy shit. Right, and no one saw Zodiac, but he's awesome in Zodiac. Oh, he's fantastic. That's a, I literally just watched that probably a week and a half ago. Again, it's on Hulu. God, what a good movie. We'll, we'll save it for our David Fincher double feature we may eventually do. <laughs> oh, um, God. But, I'm be uh, so depressed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to be the jauntiest one we do. So who was Robert Downey Jr. to you prior to this movie? Uh, Robert Downey Jr. for me was always uh, Weird Science. Right. He was the bully in Weird Science. That was the biggest thing for me, remembering him growing up. And then um, Better Off... Uh, not Better Off Dead, I'm sorry. What, less Than Zero. Right. And those were the two I always remembered him for. And then when he got into all his trouble and everything... That guy, holy shit, what happened to him? But I always liked him enough. Uh, he was always good. Like you said, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, I love that movie. And I was just, when I heard they cast him as Iron Man, I was surprised, but in a good way. I was happy that finally it wasn't a huge bankable star as a superhero. So you could get behind him as the character of Tony Stark instead of, say, how their original idea was Tom Cruise or whatever, where it's be like, well, that's Tom Cruise in the Iron Man suit. Yeah, it would just be the mummy as a version of yeah. uh, Iron right. Man if that had happened. Yeah, and I, Iron I, Man, Iron Man would have been running a lot more and shorter. I mean, he would have gotten that sort of like charm, but he wouldn't have gotten a lot of like the pathos and a lot more of like the sort of demons that are hiding underneath, which I think been. really works for his character here. The way Robert Downey Jr. plays it, it really mm-hmm. starts off. Tony Stark's arc, which of all the MCU characters, I would argue he has the most consistent arc of going from playboy asshole to a genuine hero who's still snarky, but has actually had a huge progression from here to now we're on the oncoming Avengers Infinity War. Yeah, I agree. Um, What about you, though? What was your uh, first exposure to Robert Downey Jr.? Well, Weird Science was one, but also I remember him as the asshole roommate from Back to School. Oh yeah, I, I, I remember I that. About that. Yeah, yeah, he was all over the place in those eighties movies, but also in just like random things that would happen. Like, um, okay, what's that awful Halle Berry movie where she's in the asylum? Gothica. Gothica. He was also in yeah, Gothica. Oh god, shit like that. But other things yeah, that were interesting. Yeah, he was. Film. <laughs> he was somebody who I was aware of. I just didn't really, you know, attach much to him. I was like, oh, that he's a good actor. I just don't. I didn't really attach myself to him as much. But this year was a big year for him. Not just Iron Man, but also that same year was Tropic Thunder, where he came with that amazing performance that's controversial for various reasons, but you right. can't deny the commitment to that part as uh, Kirk Lazarus. Oh, yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, he even did the uh, commentary as Kirk Lazarus. <laughs> Which is so great. Not just <laughs> not just in the the blackface stereotype, but then also by the end of it, he's in the Australian actual like voice of Kirk Lazarus. It's multi layered. That's an amazing commentary. You know, uh, it's funny you brought that up real quick. Another performance of his I want to bring up actually that I completely forgot about. It, it's the one I actually knew him most for was uh, Wayne Gale and Nash Board Killers. That's right, Batonga, Batonga, Batonga. Yeah, yeah I mean, with that awful, <laughs> that way overdone Australian accent. But he got it was, better at it by chance. Tropic Thunder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Um, and what I think really works is his sort of natural charisma worked along with director Jean Favreau's style of direction here, which this is very important to note. But um, I've heard retroactively a lot of people said around the time this movie was being made that it was a case of like we didn't have a script, we were kind of winging it with a lot of these things, and you can tell. But in, you know, other cases where this would really fall apart, here it almost feels like it's a superhero movie Robert Altman style. Not as improvised, but there is an actual looseness that I think makes it feel a lot more authentic than other superhero movies had, especially before this. Oh, I I completely agree with you. And, I mean, if you'd have had any less caliber of the main cast or the director, I mean, the potential for it to just fall apart, I I mean, is just huge. But uh, when you got these this type of talent behind it, I mean, it just worked perfect. You could tell that, you know, Robert Downey Jr. was riffing constantly, just constantly being coming up with these snarky one-off lines. 
and they would keep the rest of the cast on their toes. Right, and it would really bounce off well with people like I think particularly I love all of the earlier stuff with him and Jeff Bridges. It yes, feels so much like an uncle nephew relationship that really works, mm-hmm. especially with an, as they are older and all that. It really works authentically. Or the Gwyneth Paltrow um, Pepper Potts part, which I know she's all goop now, but there was a time <laughs> she was a great actress. She's a really talented actress, and I wish she did that more. And here it really comes off where. I believe they're back and forth. So many of these superhero movies just have the love interest and it's lame. Even the MCU's guilty of this in their later entries. Oh, um, oh repeatedly. Yes, yeah. very very much so. But she really took that part and made herself more than a secretary and more of an equal to Tony. And I like that even at the end, she has that playfulness of like, I still like you, but you did leave me alone at that party, you fucking dick. I can't believe mm-hmm. you did that. But yeah, what do you think of Paltrow in that part? Actually, you know, I was never really – it's not that I never disliked Gwyneth Paltrow. I never really got into her. Like, It's like, oh, my God, she's one of the greats because I, I personally don't think she is. But I think she's fantastic as Pepper, especially in this movie. She She's not even – like you said, she's more than even the secretary. She's basically the secretary, his mother, his housekeeper, his – she's running the show. She's doing everything, and I thought she was just perfect. And they, they bounce so well off each other. Yeah, you I felt love the romantic chemistry and playfulness between the two of them. Like, it was genuine. Right, yeah, I really love the sequence. I, I always This was a sequence that always stuck out to me ever since the first time I saw this movie, was the whole thing where she's removing the arc reactor out of his chest. Yeah. It, it's yeah. such a perfect sort of, like, almost screwball scene of the two of them bouncing off each other. And she's just like, oh, God, what do I do? It's like, it's fine. I'm going to cardiac arrest. It's cool. Just uh, make sure you get it in there <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> Robert Engine even manages to do that with artificial characters like the arm. The du- the dummy arm thing yeah. gets it's imbued with character over. by bouncing off of Robert Downey Jr. It's so great to the point where when mm-hmm. that arm thing dies kind of in Iron Man 3, I actually felt for that. <laughs> fucking arm thing <laughs> god <laughs> i gotta say i don't think i was too upset over the pneumatic arm but no i get what you're saying it was funny you know with the fu- when it kept spraying the fire extinguisher on him and shit like that like no it was it was fun they did a fantastic job of just showing tony stark just playing Would you... he's, he's so incredibly smart that he's bored right would you say i've heard a lot of people do this comparison and i'm inclined to agree but would you agree that some have said this is sort of the modern cinematic equivalent of the uh richard donner superman the first superman would you agree with that sentiment as in like it kickstarted the whole thing well there's that but i would also say in terms of like what was so great about superman was that it took a character that was mostly known as sort of like an up in the sky it's a bird's a plane serial Mm. guy and made superman a grounded character made Superman more of someone that you could relate to. And I think that's something that works here, admittingly for something that's like, oh, he's a super rich dude who is still, like, a human, but he has, like, a giant suit and all this shit, and made it very grounded. Would you agree? Um, uh, I mean, yes, I agree on that level, that, you know, yes, it it did ground both the uh, properties. Um, I think Iron Man is a far more exciting movie. Um, I happen to think the first Superman movie can be a little bit bland in parts. Um, it's a wonderful film, but I mean, it's, it's got some really boring stuff in it. But uh, It's also supremely dated. Like this one... This, I mean, 100%. To, to be fair, this movie has a few things that even 10 years later kind of dated. Like they have a Jim Cramer cameo that's like, yeah. alright, that worked for 2008, not as much now. The other ones get more aggressively bad. Like I think Iron Man 2 has Bill O'Reilly in it. Yes, so, it does. Yes, yeah. it does. all these mcu movies can be kind of guilty of that but at the same time it does ground it in a relatable universe and if anything the movies very much acknowledge the sort of timeline of that Mm -hmm. and it actually helps you kind of track the movies overall so it's like oh that firmly dates this in like mid 2000s so then as things kind of keep going along when we get to like infinity war it shows a real progression of time Especially because Robert Downey Jr. barely has aged over 10 years. Yeah, he looks fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's all that fucking karate and new age shit he's doing or whatever the fuck's going on with him. He's a, he's a sorcerer, that guy. I swear to God, he's some goddamn magician. I don't know how he's doing it. 
Now, another character who has uh, changed appearance uh, for more direct reasons in the other movies is uh, Rhodey Rhodes, uh, as played here by Terrence Howard, who would later be recast as Don Cheadle. Do we think that uh, a Mr. Howard would have been still worked in the other movies or or not? Okay. Yes, I do. I would much rather see Terrence Howard than Don Cheadle. Nothing against Don Cheadle, but, I mean, just the chemistry that him and Robert Downey Jr. had was was just spot on. I mean, just the, you know, two hours. I've been standing here two hours waiting on you now. Let's go. <laughs> you know, that, that, uh, you can have the humdrum be. <laughs> that type of shit. It was just perfect, those two. And to me, he fit the character better. You could, I believed the friendship between the two of them more compared to uh, Don Cheadle and Robert Downey. Not to say Don Cheadle's not doing a good job. He is. But I would just like to see Terrence Howard continue on. I, I hate, that's one of my biggest pet peeves when, especially in something like this that is obviously going to be a franchise, I hate recasting for monetary reasons. You know, you already started this character with that actor, just keep him on. Now, if it's something way worse, then yeah, get rid of him. But <laughs> Like I, a, like just, an Edward Norton kind of deal. Yeah, from Incredible right, Hulk, like yeah. Re, rewriting the script because you want to. <laughs> You know, that, that type of shit. Or, but, yeah, I loved Terrence Howard. I I, I would way, like, prefer him to see him uh, take up the mantle still. Uh, what about you? Do you, like, prefer him or Don Cheadle? I actually really prefer Don Cheadle. I, I think it, um, I agree with this you in terms of... This podcast is over. <laughs> well, it was a good <laughs> run of a half its episode. Um, <laughs> honestly, to me, I, I feel like, I agree that he and Tony share some good moments together. But I, I feel more like Terrence Howard's kind of phoning it in. I, I don't quite feel as engaged in Rhodey as a character. As a bouncing off board for Tony Stark, I would argue he works pretty well. But, but they didn't it, give him a lot to do, though, either in the first one. No, but even then, what he does get to do, he doesn't do a lot with. Like, I would argue, you know, Jeff Bridges doesn't get a lot to do. But he makes a lot of those scenes. Jeff Bridges made a meme out of, Tony Stark built this in a cave with a pile of scraps! That's yeah, memorable. He's, he's, he's so he's, awesome. When he's shouting down trivia, uh, Ralphie from A Christmas Story. Right, right. Peter Billingsley, yes, who was also yeah. an executive producer on this. But I just still feel like Terrence Howard, I never quite felt as much that, like, Rhodey stood out on his own. Especially a lot of the scenes where he's on his own, I just always felt like he was kind of out of it in terms of the movie. Mm -hmm. Now, I wouldn't have minded Terrence Howard continuing if we got more crazy Terrence Howard doing weird shit as Rhodey. Like Hustle and Flow Terrence Howard? <laughs> like Empire. <laughs> like, like, oh, God. Terrence Howard. Like, he's throwing fucking supervillains into trash cans like in the first God. season of Empire. <laughs> I would love the shit out of these movies and Rhodey if he did crazy things like that. He's the wild card of the group. But I still, I think right. Don Cheadle... I would argue for doing sort of like the sort of sidekick character, I think works pretty well. I I would argue that Don Cheadle, uh, especially by Iron Man three, feels more like an equal to Tony than necessarily I think Terrence Howard would have. I guess we'll never know. We'll we'll never know. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this movie established a lot of stuff about the MCU that we've been talking about in terms of like a lot of the groundedness and sort of building up some of these hints about the characters and stuff like that. Um, it also probably established some of the lesser points of the, you know, sort of Marvel formula. Like, arguably, the third act of the movie. Um, once once Ironmonger comes into the fray, it's probably yeah. where it starts kind of lessening. Um, I still would say, especially upon this rewatch, there's still fun mm -hmm. moments in the Ironmonger stuff. Like the whole point where Tony thinks he's won and takes off the glove. And yes. obviously the glove isn't there. Or the ice thing, which is a great example of setup payoff. That really works. I almost kind of wish that was the end of Iron Monker in the movie. I'm just like, that's actually a great point. You could have just ended his character on. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, but we still kind of have to have a battle. And honestly, it really starts annoying me the moment that Jeff Bridges becomes less of this kind of uncle character and it becomes maniacal villain who takes off this thing. It's like, I love the suit. Now I'm going to kill you, Tony. It's like, that's... What happened to, like, that back and forth, that betrayal that took place, especially, like, yeah. when he poisons Tony and stuff like that? You felt like, the oh, shit, this guy is really just backstabbing. We knew, obviously, by that point, because we saw the terrorist scenes and stuff like that, of that betrayal. But it, it just didn't feel as, like, emotionally grounded as the earlier stuff between the two of them was. 
No, I agree. He got very mustache twirling. I think where before he was just really sinister and, you know, almost, he felt like he's, even though what he was doing, you know, taking a suit to weaponize it and, you know, potentially kill whoever, uh, and did kill that, the terrorist guy by poisoning him or whatever you want to call it. But, uh, it still felt like corporate espionage, black market dealings and stuff like that. And as soon as he gets the suit on, like you said, he's like, the power, Tony. You're like, oh, God, get the hell out of here. <laughs> like, it's too much. I will say this about Iron Man. I still would argue that this is easily the best first standalone of the MCU. Out of, out of phase one. Let's put it out of phase one. Well, out of that. phase one, I yeah, I would generally agree with that. Um, I'd still say that uh, my favorite in terms of like introducing characters uh, would probably be the first Guardians. I mean, yeah, it has to be. Right. I, yeah, I would, there's no I would question. Yeah. Um, but I, because it's characters you don't know. Well, yeah, and like, fucking nobody knew at all. Like, Iron right, Man, at least, right. I had heard of Iron Man before. Iron Man had a cartoon in the 90s. Guardians yes. didn't have shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it really establishes the Tony Stark character pretty well, especially a lot of the stuff in the cave that we haven't mentioned with that Jensen. Um, I, I thought that, a, a lot of that stuff especially does a great job of establishing Tony and having a sympathetic side character and all that for him to bounce off of, and him really face sort of the demons that's there. And then later on, the, the press conference scene, um, both of them, yes. but, but the first yes. one especially, where he just kind of, you know, sits eating off the of the podium, yep. eating cheeseburgers, and says a line I forgot about, but really hits harder now with all the other MCU stuff of, I never got to say goodbye to my father. Yeah. That really hits hard when you get to especially yeah, like Civil a War. Line. Yeah, it, it, it's a, it's one of those things where it establishes a lot of the stuff that uh, Kevin Feige, who's the guy that's been responsible for a lot of the MCU stuff, the big producer behind the curtain, um, has yeah, that really doing all right for himself. No, I, I thought he's uh, doing pretty well. He's um, doing okay. Interestingly, started off as a associate producer on the first X Men. Oh no, shit. Yeah, yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Well, so I'm yeah. sure he was there at that point, just like, "Hey guys, what if we like put all these people together?" Shut up, Kevin. That'll right. never work. Get the hell out of here, Kevin. But you got Moxie, kid. <laughs> Stan Lee just came in like Excelsior. I like you, yeah. Moxie. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, also, this was a fun Stan Lee cameo. One of many, of course, the Hugh Hefner bit. Right. One of the highlights, yep. I think. Yep, of the, that was a good one. Cameos. Well, I do want to talk about Jeff Bridges a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. Especially even that part you were just talking about where, you know, Tony's sitting there with the cheeseburgers and he says that line, you know, I never got to say goodbye to my father and all that. <laughs> the way Jeff Bridges ends the uh, the conference is so businessman, cheeseball, just sleaze. You know, oh, we could take from this that Tony's back. That's how he ends it. <laughs> like, dude, this guy just crumbled in front of everybody. He's been through this horrible thing and you're celebrating it. I, I loved him in this movie until the end. I, I, loved, I loved his look. Like, even the way they had it, he's bald with the big beard, he looked so classy, and just, and who gave, gives a shit about Obadiah Stane in the comics? He's, he's a D-level character, and for that to even be the first villain, everybody expected the Mandarin for the first villain, because the Mandarin is like Iron Man's Joker, he's his main villain, he's his Lex Luthor, and the fact that they still really haven't done it, even though... They did, but then they realized they fucked up and did that one shot where they were like, no, that wasn't the real Mandarin. There is a real Mandarin. And for Jeff Bridges to take this character, there's really not a lot of meat on the bones for the character and just make it something that was so good. And, you know, he's rarely brought up in the pantheon of the MCU villains because, unfortunately, there's not that many good ones. But I'd argue he's definitely up there as one of the better. I mean, if you put him against some of it, like, you know, my boy Malekith, or, you know, Abomination, or some of these, at least, you know, Jeff Bridges, there's some sort of an arc to his character. Yeah, I, I think it is just a problem, though, of, like, the punctuation mark of the him in the suit kind of does, like, mask it's it so a lot. so bad. People, unfortunately. It, it's, it's a shame, because then again, of, like, the MCU characters, especially, like, obviously, you know, we can all agree that the villain problem is also an issue with a lot of these movies. Iron Man, just in terms of the, like, cinematic stuff, I'm not sure about it in the comics, if there's any other ones mm-hmm. I've explored. Most of the villains are pretty weak. Like, even, I, I would oh, honestly terrible. say, yeah, controversially, I would honestly say that the, the most memorable villain of his, to me, 
is the Ben Kingsley Mandarin for obviously controversial oh, reasons. Right, yeah. But, but like my problem with that movie is more just that Guy Pierce is the actual Mandarin. He was so lame in that movie. Oh, he was That's, horrible. That was more my issue than the Ben Kingsley aspect of it. I, I like that daring risk. I wish they stuck to it. But that's a different huge, movie. Huge risk. Two more things I want to bring up about this yes. one. Uh, one is, you know, when they were talking about doing this in the Mandarin, they were also talking about maybe doing Fin Fang Foom in this movie. Now, do you know who Fin Fang Foom is? Correct me if I'm wrong, he's like the big dragon character, right? He's a giant, like, Chinese dragon. Skyscraper size. What a cool visual that would have been. But... On a more controversial, you brought up uh, your boy Jensen, and I'm going to call him your boy because fuck that guy. That guy, <laughs> that guy became Uncle Iroh in The Last Airbender, and I will never forget it for that. <laughs> that ruined that guy for me. And that horrible Shyamalan Last Airbender, that's the guy who played Uncle Iroh. Look, I don't say fuck Asif Manvi, and he was in that. <laughs> like, I don't, don't blame the, blame the actors, blame fucking I'll blame, Sh- I'm going to blame everybody. He oh, signed I... on the dotted line. I'm bringing the system down. Oh, man, when I get a bad double feature, I gotta put some in my back pocket. Uh... Oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, something I also want to bring up, actually, in terms of just sure. on the craft level, um, I'll, we should mention that in terms of the effects work on here, it's an actual mix of practical and CG, and this was actually one of the last films that Stan Winston worked on before he passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that really works, because you do get, like... Obviously, like, when he's suiting up and flying, there's obviously, like, very CG stuff, but I kind of have missed the practical suits in the other Iron Man movies that have progressed from here. Absolutely. And because this one actually still holds up. I mean, there are a couple scenes where it's dated, but it still looks decent, especially when he is in the practical suit. Nowadays, you know, the suits have become so polished and, you know, they change them so much and everything, and everything looks like the the fucking Batman suit from the Dark Knight Rises with all this little tectonic plate armor and all this shit on it. Just, they streamline everything. Everything looks RoboCop remake. And it's, dude, I want to see the Iron Man, the classic Iron Man suit. Like, this was the suit. It looked great. It was perfect. I'm not bothered by them upgrading here and there. But now it's just, it's it's so polished in CGI literally almost takes me out of the movie modern day cgi is almost killing movies for me believe it or not it, it, because it, there's it, the realm of believability is gone there's no weight to any character anymore that you know it's just i don't know man i don't know i'm getting old i, I mean for me i guess because i have a slightly younger perspective and being like as engaged in cg as i've been since i've you know kind of been aware of movies i i just think cg works kind of best when either you do it limited in a way that if you're trying to ground it, or if mm-hmm. you're going crazy bizarre, um, you kind of go into that. Like Do- Doctor Strange did a great job of that. I would argue. Yeah, because it's you don't have nothing to base it on, so it's an original right. creation, and that works right. Like even Avatar, even though that surprisingly does not hold up that well, which is insane to me. But that there was nothing like that, so it, you know you have nothing to base it against. When you've already seen the Iron Man suit done as well as you have in the first movie, and then they keep changing it, it's like, why even change it? It's well, it's to sell toys. That's that's very clear. To the that's a hundred percent. It's, it's, it's oh, all look, it's, especially by the time you got to Iron Man two, and he's, he has like what, like fucking five different suits or something in, in that Iron one. Man, in Iron Man three, when all the suits come fly in and help him at the end, there were yes. toys for all those suits, and you didn't even see half of them. No. Um, it's it's like I get it for like especially... oil driller Iron Man. Oh, <laughs> Old prospector Iron Man. He's got a bunch of pots and pans. It, it's like when I was a kid and I would get like I couldn't get the regular Batman toy, so I would have to get like yep. Surfer Batman. I'm like, what the fuck oh, is yeah. this? I had like a scuba Batman. <laughs> oh god, yeah. <laughs> Shit like that, yeah, for sure. Um. Well, yeah, and uh, and also uh, even with the Iron Monger character, they actually built like a half, you know, that would go like from the waist of it, like an actual giant puppet that does show up in a few scenes, and that works really well. I almost wish we got more of that, like big fucking puppet Iron Monger, and I might be more engaged with it. Um, but you know, mixing the two, like it is done here, arguably I think works better than having all the CG. I would concur with that. CG is best utilized when it's a mix of practical. Yes. So any final okay. thoughts on Iron Man? <laughs> but, I mean, this is where it all started, man. The, the modern box office and modern movies today wouldn't be what they are without this movie. I mean, we wouldn't have the big blockbusters that we have now because if we didn't have Iron Man. So, 
I mean, it's spearheaded a whole generation of films. If anything, it's worth it because it's what brought Robert Downey Jr. back. I mean, really brought him back to the to the limelight. And I mean, what else can you say about it? It started everything. Ten years of movies because of this one. I mean, box office record after box office record, star making movies. I mean, Chris Pratt. You know, he had Parks and Rec, but he wouldn't be where he is now without Guardians. <laughs> Shit, man, it's the foundation of what we have now. So you gotta love it, if anything, just for that. Yes, and it also works really well as a film on its own. I was especially interested because I've been doing some MCU like rewatches in preparation for Avengers: Infinity War coming out, and right after this, I rewatched the first Avengers, and it's mm-hmm. interesting how much that movie like works. If you've never seen any of those movies or have only seen Iron Man, like Kevin Feige and them knew that like most of the people who were seeing Avengers had at least seen Iron Man. So that yeah. was a good template and they just needed to introduce more of like Captain America and these other people and give them just the briefest introduction to where you get it. But let's keep right. moving with the story. Yeah, that's that's what made Avengers. Avengers was a great movie, the first one. Age of Ultron, meh. But Avengers was really good. Yes, you can tell, even with that one, like it is still going off that base level of Iron Man in terms of not just the, the plotting, but also with introducing the characters, the dynamics between the characters. That naturalism that we keep talking about is really what I think gave so much to you know this entire franchise. And we haven't even talked about some of the other characters they introduce here that would play such pivotal roles. Like Phil Coulson, as played by Clark mm-hmm. Gregg, who is great here and is a... Like, the running gag of the shield thing is really fun. And also it right. really starts to get you invested. And some of the other phase one movies do so before he gets killed off in Avengers. And it really hurts, even though he's yeah, such a small sucked. character. Yeah, that sucked. Colson was awesome. And I haven't seen it. I actually have never watched a single episode of the show. Uh, Agents of shield. Cause no, but yeah, <laughs> he's, he's really good, man. The weird thing with agents of shield is I've only seen the first two seasons, but there's a really good, season in that where it's like the back half of season one and the front half of season two are like where the show hit its peak for me and yeah, it's that's just what that... i heard and it's like i ain't got time to watch you know six shit episodes to get to five good ones or whatever <laughs> it is the, no the sad thing no it's more like 10 because it's one of those 24 season shows i don't blame oh you at good all. god come no. on no tv series needs more than fucking 12 episodes 12 is even pushing it half the time that's what network does man and i and i still never thought like they the way they introduced the idea of like how colson came back i still think it doesn't excuse doing it i it's, have no idea how they even did it it's it's I fucking heard, dumb is, is he a fucking robot is he a robot <laughs> no no it's not that it's not like oh. mild decoy which was like the big sort of rumor around the time tldr they had some backdoor thing to revive an avenger but they just did it for colson that's the what? in-universe excuse for it. It's dumb. I know it's dumb. Save that, save that shit for, like, fucking Thor. What are you bring that Coulson for? He was the <laughs> one good guy. Um, but we're oh, getting off track God. there. We also haven't talked about, of course, um, the guy who brought Coulson back and was a big linchpin of a thing with this universe was uh, Samuel Jackson's Nick Fury. Yep. First appearance of him. I don't think he really gave a shit. Uh, Samuel Jackson, he's gotten to the point where... He just doesn't give a shit anymore when he's in movies. I'd argue that he didn't give a shit in any of these until really like where I felt he was trying was in the winter soldier. So it's like, and to be honest, I don't care that it's, you know, the ultimate version of Nick Fury who was based on Samuel L. Jackson, but I wanted my old school cigar chomp and, you know, white streaks in the hair, Nick Fury. So I was a little bummed out. I like it now, but at first I was like, oh, damn it. But he just doesn't care. He's phoning it in in the first couple of movies, man. You get, you, he really is. I think it works for this one scene here. I would agree more in terms of like when he shows up in like Iron Man 2 and it's like, hey, Tony, here's some exposition. Shut mm-hmm. up, Samuel Jackson. Um, <laughs> Dude, right. Seriously, stop. Um, but I would even say by Avengers, I would say is where it actually started kind of caring. And I thought he actually had like a really good back and forth with some of the other characters. It's more when like the less he has to do, the more he doesn't give as much of a shit. If he's just showing up like, hey, Captain America, you're in the present now. Welcome to New York. Let's go. <laughs> like, it's not that's Right, much. yeah, basically. Um, it's very but, Mace Windu-ish. 
But even here, it's just like, you can kind of, it works fine for here. And I think that that stinger is a great example of even building up the that sort of distrust with the Nick Fury character from the beginning in terms of like he's broken into this guy's house and he's doing all this shit backhandedly, all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it does a great job of that, introducing the idea of the Avengers. I, like, I didn't even, like, this was one of those, I didn't see this scene until I heard, like, oh, wait, there was a scene at the end and I watched it on, like, bootleg on YouTube. <laughs> like, it was just, like, yeah, me like too. Same fucking camp. Exactly, yeah. And now, because of that, literally Every ev- movie ever. E- ever. Yeah, e- even... I worked at a theater not a few years ago, and that was the bane of my existence, even for, it's just like, it's like the Ratchet and Clank movie. Why, why are you staying here? Why were you here in the first place? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, um, we're getting off track from the final thoughts. Just overall, I agree. Really great start. A, a very pivotal movie for not just the MCU, but cinematic history in general. It's a yeah. big kicking off point. Um, but a bit of trivia to transition us into the next feature. Um, you mentioned Tom Cruise was one of many choices, tempted to be Iron Man during its various different stages of production. Other people were Clive Owen, Sam Rockwell, who would of course show up in Iron Man 2, and the star of our next feature, Nicolas Cage, which is as good a time as any to get to... This thing... There's no conscience... Hunger. The rider's going to come out. And when he does, he'll destroy whoever's got it coming. Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance, released February 17th, 2012. This is the second in the Ghost Rider film starring Nicolas Cage uh, after 2007's Ghost Rider. I guess the, the, the big thing I want to start with is, mm-hmm. um, you know, our show is based on duality, better or worse. Which is the better movie, Ghost Rider or Ghost Rider 2? Ghost Rider. Go on. I hate... Okay, well... God, I don't even know. Look, <laughs> I really... This is really... God, fuck these movies, but... <laughs> All right, and I chose this shit. Uh, now, Neville Dean and Taylor, I like them. I lo- the Crank movies are so fun; mm-hmm. they're just pure crazy fun. Yes, I don't know that their pure crazy style transitioned to Ghost Rider. Well, I don't think it was the right property for them to do. Uh, Ghost Rider works best at its core as like a dark, you know, horror based property um this movie is just all over the place i mean the fucking highlander is in it (laughs) it's like what what the hell is going on here man you know aj from empire records is the main bad guy it's like this is this is outrageous at least in the first one yeah yeah fucking west bentley as the bad guy which is really bad too but there was at least cohesion and there wasn't a giant, you know, piece of fucking whatever it is, digging machinery that all of a sudden gets possessed because Ghost Rider gets behind the wheel of it. it. It was just, it was, I don't know, man. I liked the look of Ghost Rider more in this one. Like, I liked the charred skull and everything. I didn't like the ticks that they gave him. I, I didn't like, the story is just, it's its insanity. This movie's insane. What, what, which one do you like better? That's hard, man. That's like a Sophie's Choice. Well, yeah, <laughs> but uh, the opposite like, way. Oh, well, yeah, it's just like, can opposite. both of them die? Uh, can both yeah, of right. them I die? want you to think of both. <laughs> Why not both? Um, so, I want to preface this by saying I completely agree with what you're saying in terms of this movie is an incoherent mess a lot of times. It doesn't really hold together very well. And I was very disappointed in this less as a sequel to Ghost Rider, which was a movie I didn't really like at Wait, all. Is this a true sequel, though? Not really. I mean, it's, the only... It's more of a reboot, really. But basically, they're, they're, it's very much an example of Sony, who we talked about the Spider-Man movies earlier, um, trying to mm-hmm. save and salvage a franchise out of the Marvel properties they owned. Which, uh, speaking of which, we're doing this around the same time uh, the one of the big trailers for Venom came out. 
which shows oh. they're still doing it. Ah, because whoa, oh god, whoa. I know. Um, are one of the most divisive trailers to come out in a long time. People who like it just like that it's not two for days. Like, yeah, they're out of control. They're that's out of what, control. Whatever. But anyway, to, to to go back to Ghost Rider, I would still say, despite all the incoherence, despite a lot of the issues that are still inherent in the second one, gun to my head, I would rather watch two in terms of, despite what, you know, that first movie has in cohesion, it has so much more boredom. There are moments in Ghost Rider 2 where I am bored, but then there are sudden weird bursts of energy that I'm like, this is crazy, this is weird, but it's at least something I can latch onto, as opposed to, I find the first Ghost Rider to be a bland, forgettable experience. Yeah, but the first one's got a monkey and he's really into jelly beans. That's like, one there's, scene. There's funny stuff in the first one, at least. I, I, I don't had, think it's supposed to be funny. It's just terrible. But They still. had Donald Logue and they did nothing with him. They, I mean, did nothing, nothing with him. As opposed to just, like I said, this movie does waste characters, obviously. Like, I think uh, a big sin we can talk about is Idris Elba's in this movie. What is it with that guy? He just takes such shit roles. I, I mean, I, he does well in them, but he's just he's horrible movies. I would argue that Idris Elba is a guy who, despite being clearly talented, is also a consummate working actor. He's a guy that comes from the stage and television. Like, if you look at his IMDb credits, it's all television for, like, a solid decade before he even got oh, to yeah. film. And I mean, he's so, popping up in huge movies and still doing Luther at the same time. Right, and even at yeah. this point, you can tell that Idris Elba is still... Just like, I I got a job, and I'm going to commit to doing the best job I possibly can with it, even if it's for something as not good as a Ghost Rider 2. And that's a tragedy in terms of just, like, he, you can tell every single second he is trying to make this bit-nothing part that's, like, he's a weird, like... I don't even know, like, the plot thing, you're right, is so incoherent with this movie. I don't even not... know what he's supposed to be, really. Like, I'm not 100% sure what he is. He's like some sort of messenger for the monks or something, where he's like connected to God. But he's got like God. bright orange eyes, right? Like, so, like, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what his role really is in terms mm -hmm. of the plot. But at the same time, there's so many like fun bits of him doing weird shit, like when he's just like attacking people. It's just like, oh, I'm sorry, I bumped you on the head and shit like that. And I'm like, man, Idris, you're making the best out of this. I wish they gave you more. And it's stuff like that that makes me at least not consistently entertained, but spottily interested. Because even, like, a big example for me is that I would argue this has more of the crazy Nick Cage I love than that first movie ever does. And stuff like, when yeah, he, conf oh, when he like, confronts that one guy at the uh, concert thing or whatever the fuck it is, mm -hmm. and he's like... He's scratching at the door. Shit like that is way more memorable than anything in that first Ghost Rider movie. It doesn't make sense in terms of really the coherent narrative that isn't there, but it's at least a memorable scene that I still think about. Shit like that, or when he's on the motorcycle and transforming. Shit like that. There are memorable bits and pieces to me that I find at least stylistically kind of fun. See, I am definitely one of those people who's not on the crazy Nicolas Cage bandwagon. But if we find it entertaining, I literally find it like nails on a chalkboard. I can't. I, he drives You me find nuts. him scratching at the door? Oh, God. <laughs> it really got bad for me. <laughs> it's well, it's always been bad. But, like, the first kick ass, when he's on fire and he's screaming, like, like Switch to Kryptonite! You know, tactics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Use rabbit light! <laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck me, man. What is going on with this? And then this one comes out, and I'm like, oh, that's just him now. <laughs> that's just that's just him. See, but I oh, find that way more interesting... I find that way more interesting to me than in the first movie or some of these other sort of recent new millennium turn Nicolas Cage board movies. That's way more depressing to me. It's just seeing him do shit like... I'll, I'll give you that. At least in this, you can tell he's having fun. At, at, at some point, like, yeah, he's there are at least points where he's, he's having energetic. fun, which I at least find to be kinetic and crazy and at least brief oasis of, you know, enjoyment. Even that crane scene you're talking about, despite, I agree, I'm not sure why that crane is there. I'm not sure what its purpose is. <laughs> I'm not sure why they're, because it's, it's a problem of, like, this movie was shot in Romania, so they're just like, oh, let's get whatever the fuck we can, because it's mostly just, 
endless wasteland of nothing. Um, <laughs> Sorry and... to our future Romanian listeners. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure you're a lovely people, and I. Uh, Your just... podcast is shit. <laughs> oh no, the Romanian mafia is after us. Um, <laughs> um, but even like that crane sequence, it I don't know why that crane's there, but I kind of don't give a shit because it's a really cool kinetic sequence that feels like once again th- those moments feel like Devil D and Taylor kind of coming out and doing their crazy style. I can see a better, more memorable, crazy cult movie that could come out of this. I just think it's more a problem of, like, when you get the, uh, we should mention, David Goyer story, um, which he was a co-writer on this, um, coming in about, like, what you're talking about with the Fucking monks God. and all that other stuff, when they try and have a narrative to it, is where it slows down completely and is, like, dead. It, it's yeah, just, like, I mean, doesn't work completely. It, it completely. Once the fucking Highlander shows up with his goddamn, you know, Coney Island tattoos... You're like this is just what is going on here? I do not understand what is going on. Like, I, it's just, it's not. I don't consider myself to be, you know, stupid. I mean, I am, but not that stupid to where I can't pick up the plot line of a movie. Now, I could just could be because I was just so disinterested, <laughs> which is quite possible. Um, but I just I don't understand. I don't. Let's put the, I don't understand what they were trying to do. What kind of plot they were trying to make. It feels like they're trying to ground sort of like this Ghost Rider character with like the whole demon boy subplot angle of it. That stuff I really think falls flat. <laughs> One because that kid's terrible, uh, but oh, he's an awful horrible. actor. Um, and even like which some other that, people, he's Danny Ketch, which I don't know if you know your comic history or not, but Danny Ketch is who became Ghost Rider after Johnny Blaze. Oh, comics. see, a cinematic universe building right there. <laughs> yup. If they would have made this a chase movie and left a lot of that shit out, this movie would have been a lot more serviceable. No, I agree with Just that. I... With Johnny Blades, the kid, and the mom on the road, and then the fucking devil chasing them. Even the whole shit with Blackout was completely unnecessary. Yes, and we should mention the devil here as played by Sieran Hines, who uh, was originally played by Peter Fonda in the first movie, but I, I wouldn't have minded if they had... You know, just once again, given more of Seer and Heinz to do. Like, even with a line as dumb as when he does something to the kid and they're like, what did you do? It's just like, you know computers. Think of it um, as what I just did as downloading a program. It's a terrible line. A garbage oh line. Oh, my God. Awful. The but... devil. Like, honestly, <laughs> if the devil was real, <laughs> why would he fucking say that? Why would that be, like, how to explain it? Why, why would he even explain it to anybody? I did some evil shit. I'm the devil. What do you, what do you, what do you want me to tell you? <laughs> Get the fuck off my back. What, 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 what are you asking me for? <laughs> right. Get the fuck out. Say hello to your mother for me. <laughs> See, now Mark Wahlberg, Satan, we haven't gotten that yet. That, that, I'm excited for that. Uh, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Get, say hello to your mother for me. All right. <laughs> As the second in command, Andy Samberg. It'll be perfect. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it'll be perfect. Uh, I, I still think that, like, if... Sierra and Hines, giving him more to do as a villain would be a lot more interesting, because then you get, like, Johnny Whitworth yeah. as the rotting dude who's terrible. Horrible dude. And, he, yeah, he's Blackout. Now, Blackout, in the comics, he, you know, I know it shouldn't matter, because, you know, comics to movies, whatever, but why even call him Blackout? Because Blackout in the comics, his power was literally cause Blackouts. He didn't do the shit where he made people rot and all that. He just... No light, no light could shine around him. That was pretty much it. So, it's a shit character. So why even include it in the movie? You got the devil. Give the devil some henchmen like they did. And that's it. That's all you need. He's so bad. It's so hard to watch. I, I can't believe I picked this movie. I literally am like <laughs> mad at myself now. Especially when he has opportunities. Like, I could see something like the sequence where he's like getting lunch out of it. Like, the random guy's car that he stole mm-hmm. and like the stuff is rotting in his hand i could see that working he just can't do it though it oh, just he's he, terrible. Has, he has no personality to put into a part like that which would be like sort of like a lead henchman guy i, I can see the character they're trying to do with him which is sort of like he's a lead henchman guy he wants to prove himself he wants to be you know somebody who can eventually like take over the business or whatever but it just ends up being so much more tossed off to the side and not that interesting a character and so bland that it just, especially yeah, when awful. facing off against Nick Cage, it's just like that. You want somebody like, I don't know, a Travolta in Face Off. You want somebody who can kind of go to those weird levels sw- with Cage. I, sh- I swear to God, if they would have done Travolta in this movie, I would have literally probably never watched a movie again. 
I can't. I can't. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do another dose of Travolta and Cage together. There's no way. I, I can't do it. The fact oh my god, this apple was rotten. It's so weird. <laughs> oh my god. I'm uh, a big Face Off fan, actually. I, I really. Well, Face Off. Look, Face Off is fun. I will admit. Face Off is actually fun, and I've seen it a lot of times. But I couldn't do another one like modern day Nick Cage and Travolta. Get the fuck out of here. That would be a lot more sad now because they're both in that directed video. I don't give a shit phase of their careers. That's really sad. Where they're just hey, Travolta's oh. in a movie coming out directed by Fred Durst. Oh my god! <laughs> Look, yeah. That movie sounded interesting though. It's about like what he's a stalker, a stalker thing. Yeah, it's like a celebrity stalker thing. I'm like, I'm I'm kind of curious about that. I don't know. <laughs> it, I, I guess <laughs> it, it, that at least sounds more interesting than whatever directed video movie he just put out in a red box. Like right now, he right. just Travolta himself put it in the local red boxes in L.A. <laughs> Oh my god, look at this movie, it's so weird. One dollar. That's a sidekick. Sidekick. How much for three taquitos? (laughs) He's some Sasan died of 7 Eleven. (laughs) Okay, we're going really off track. So, are there any moments in Ghost Rider 2 that you enjoy? I, uh, I like the look of Ghost Rider. I think they did a cool job, like with the bike where it's all melted and stuff. Um,. Some of the action scenes work real good. Like, I like when he's throwing the devil up in the air and then whipping his chain, pulling him back down and shit like that. But, I mean, honestly, that's got to be about it. Now, was Nicolas Cage contracted to be in this one? That's what I'm thinking happened. I'm thinking when he did Ghost Rider 1, he probably had a contract for it in case it turned into a franchise. So that's why they put him in here. Right. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Who would you cast, then, besides Nicolas Cage in the role of Johnny Blaze? Who would be a good Johnny Blaze? Think, to? Dude, Neville and Taylor, they should have thrown Statham in there. Oh my god, that would actually be pretty cool. That would be amazing. <laughs> Oi, I'm the Ghost Rider. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's no. all the time. Oi, Shit. look at my eyes. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you excuse me, I got a giant shark to catch. Right. Oh God! Yeah, but anyways, yeah. No, I would have liked to see Statham. I think that that worked for these guys. I can't believe Statham hasn't been cast in a comic book movie yet. He said that he doesn't want to be. He's been famously like yeah. sort of against the comic book movie kind of thing. Yeah, because I guess they were actively pursuing him for Bullseye and on the Daredevil Netflix. Yeah, I just think it should have been Nicolas Cage. That's all. When I think of Ghost Rider, I don't think of Nicolas Cage. Period. And I was never a huge Ghost Rider fan growing up because he really, I mean, he's been around for a long time in other incarnations, but when they put him in the leather with the chain whip and all that, I mean, it got, that was during like the, you know, mid nineties extreme era where you literally had a character named extreme in Marvel comics. And it's just, I never got into him, dude, ever. And now it's like, I don't really care, but it's a comic book movie, so I want, I'm going to see it for the most part. I think I see them all. It's just, but Nicolas Cage is so bad. He's so bad. And then you get Neville, Dean, and Taylor, who are just crazy kinetic, and you throw, let Nicolas Cage do whatever the hell he wants. And it, it makes, you know, if you're an epileptic, good lord. <laughs> like, just don't oh, no, yeah, this, this movie is not for those who have epilepsy at all. There's so many flashes. <laughs> no, we re- like, like the one where, listen to another moment that I just find kind of interesting for how weird it is. It makes for a good gif, not a good random moment in the movie of like, when like the weird sort of power thing happens to Nick Cage, to Ghost Rider, and things go white. And then he comes back and he's circling around in the sky like it's a video game, like, error glitch thing. <laughs> yeah. Just, I, I have no idea why the fuck that's there. I It kind of looks cool to me, but I don't know, once again, why the fuck that just happened at all. If no, we I had don't. more moments like that, though, I would find this more consistently entertaining. If we just had bizarre, just weird, in the tree. crazy bits. Well, less that, because that's just, like, a really bad Photoshop. <laughs> but I don't mind that idea, <laughs> though. I li- I li- kind yeah. of like the weirdness of that idea. It's just executed terribly. I just think that's that's the problem. It's like that sort of crazy spirit. I would argue that that would make for a more memorable movie than this one, which feels like because it's interesting. I was doing some research, and apparently Sony was going to go ahead and make this like a hard R, weird, crazy thing, more on the line of say maybe like a Deadpool, and then they got cold feet and made it PG thirteen. And you can tell that, that like there's so many points where they oh, want to yeah. go all the way over the edge, and then they just kind of pull back out. And I think if you did Ghost Rider more in the vein of something kind of crazy and zingy, almost like the original Mask comics, 
but just with like a Ghost yes. Rider. I yeah. think that would really work. Um, that, I that's... think so. I mean, you could tell they pulled them back. Mm-hmm. That they wanted to go not, more nuts with it, which is crazy because it's it's crazy already. But yeah, I can agree with that. I mean, if you're going to do the character, and you're not going to go the full rated R scary horror route, then have, make it. That's a, make it goofy. Like this movie is goofy, but it's also on top of an intelligible plot. So it just doesn't fit. It doesn't. No, this yeah. movie doesn't know what it wants to. Be. You know, I would love to see. Speaking no of idea. Nick Cage, I would love to see um, Patrick Lussier do a Ghost Rider movie. And Patrick Lussier yeah, is a guy who did the Drive Angry 3D. That movie's so fun. I would That's love to Nick see that like. guy do a Ghost Rider movie. That's the way to, like, honestly, I would say Drive Angry is the best Ghost Rider movie that's existed. I agree. I can yeah. agree. I will absolutely agree with that. That I mean, is more that of way, what yeah. this should have been. And they just, and that movie got ignored and no one gave a shit about it. But that's one that deserves to have so much more love. That movie's so fun. It is absolutely a blast. I can agree with that. Yes. Now, since you asked me, what about you? If you had to cast somebody else than Nick Cage, who would you go with? Um... It's weird because I know I'm not as familiar with the Ghost Rider character in the comics, honestly. Like most of my exposure is like this, or um, just like the general look of the character, which I find interesting. Um, I, your Satan pick isn't bad. I think that's the right angle. As somebody who's kind of like tight knit, kind of like someone who's fits like a biker persona. Like somebody right. who you look at him in a bar and you're like you don't want to mess with that guy, and when you do, you get skull head uh, kind of flaming up. Um, I would really like to see, I don't know, somebody, obviously he's been in the MCU, so I don't know if you would want to necessarily do this, and it's a weird choice, but somebody like, mm-hmm. almost like a Michael B. Jordan, I think, in terms of someone who you see him, like and he's him. like, yeah. that dude's intimidating, that dude's, like, I don't want to fuck with that guy, but then when you fuck with him, he just, like, his face peels off, and he's got fiery skull and shit like that. I That's the kind of, like, a quiet intensity is somebody who needs I to I could be. see that. You know, I still have yet to see Black Panther. Oh my god! There's... I know. Fuck I'm the one. We're doing a double feature. I'm um, putting that something else in my other pocket. It's, it's weird. It's gonna be playing in theaters at the same time as Infinity War. Still, like it's still That's playing. Crazy. That is crazy. Dude, it's it's fucking a big mega hit. Um, but once again, we're getting sidetracked. Uh, it's almost as if we're talking about better movies than Ghost Rider Two. Um, so which is not hard to do. I mean, that's, no, that's really true. Not hard to do. Not not at all. Um, but let's go into final thoughts then on Ghost Rider. Spirit of Vengeance. Oh, right, please! I, I'm going to let you go ahead and start because oh, I'm going to oh. be short and sweet. <laughs> oh well, well, for me, uh, I've, I've said it here where I don't like this movie. I don't think it's a good movie, but there's like a peek into some of like the weirder, interesting stylistic choices that could have made for a better movie. That's the bigger thing with this movie. I'm not mad at this movie. I don't hate this movie. I'm more disappointed in this movie more as a neville dean taylor experiment, oh, which that's so much worse it's that's that's like a, you got a bad grade like you got a bad grade or something that's or... to quote the simpsons that's mom for mad <laughs> but uh <laughs> it, 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 it's just because i can see the potential in there for a crazy weird culty movie that would deserve more love i would love to you know say no this movie deserves so much better it is so underrated you guys just don't understand but it isn't the case. It's just more a thing of I can see bright, shining moments, and it's just clustered in a plot that's really incoherent and doesn't really come together at all. It feels like a movie that went through so many different drafts. And it shows really that Sony has a real problem with when they actually try, they fail. When they actually, on the studio, is so invested in trying to make this, you know, any property into like a big franchise, it's colossal failure see the spider-man amazing Mm spider-man movies see even spider-man 3 aside from the first two spider-man even the first spider-man has issues like that like shoving in macy gray in the middle of that first fucking spider-man movie is totally a sony decision what the fuck was that about (laughs) god damn it who's under contract (laughs) hey nutmeg (laughs) fantasy let's put that in here it's 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 ridiculous (laughs) um it's (laughs) fucking green goblin suit too (laughs) <laughs> save it um i just i think overall you know it's it's just a, it really is one of many examples of sony kind of coming in trying to take a director's vision that maybe would have worked maybe wouldn't have i don't know but would have been at least more ultimately memorable and more fun and more of like a 
underground cult movie than whatever this is, which ends up, you know, being forgotten and ends up getting the rights go back to Marvel. That's what happens, Sony. That's what happens when you do this, Sony. And now you're rely you're literally backpacking on Marvel now because like we got Spider Man rights, right? So we can make money now. And when they do have an accidental hit like that Jumanji movie, um, they're gonna fuck it up if they do a sequel to that. They're gonna they're gonna fuck it up somehow. That 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 worked. It was weird. They're gonna they, they, do a they, sequel, and they will fuck it up. Yeah. They will fuck it up because now they care. They should just be so hands off. Right, exactly. That would work way better for them. But your short and sweet final thoughts, real quick. As from what I understand, the Ghost Rider character. I know he's been on that Agents of Shield show, but it's the modern day Ghost Rider. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess they're doing from the talk. You know, that it comes up every year that there's gonna be a Netflix version of the character. I think if you're gonna do it, that's the way to do it. I, there does not need to be another Ghost Rider movie. There, there just absolutely does not. Or have him be like a Hawkeye or a Black Widow capacity where he's just part of the team. Uh, just, and about this movie, just, just fuck this movie, man. <laughs> fuck, fuck, fuck this movie so hard. Fuck it so hard. Uh, it don't, don't, it's just, it's not worth any time that you would put into it, in my opinion. Like, not a second. And that's about literally all I have to say about this movie. I have nothing for this movie. In, in terms of your other plans, I would more agree with the Hawkeye scenario to me, because I would have said more of like, oh yeah, do like a, you know, a Netflix show until I saw something like The Punisher came out and I, mm-hmm. I haven't even been able to finish that shit. I, it's just so bland. They, they, they need to cut those fucking oh. things even down from 13. I just... Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it, it needs a good 8 to 10 episodes max. I would say 8 episodes would be perfect. Um, but well, I actually kind of like the Punisher show, but whatever. That's another story. <clears throat> that's another discussion for a different time. But that is the end of our little show. Um, before we go, we want to thank uh, Chris Oliver for the music that's used at the start of our show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Ollie's a good dude. Known him for a long time. Good guy. So you can find us, uh, actually, our... Twitter account is at D-E-D-B-Pod. You can also email us if you don't have Twitter at doubleedgedoublebill at gmail.com. So you, if you don't have Twitter, you can email us there. And uh, we also have our own uh, social media accounts. Um, you can find me at not the who's Tommy. And uh, Adam, what's your Twitter account? How appropriate for this episode? <laughs> <laughs> the awesome Twitter name that I can't believe no one took. Malekith fan six nine six nine. The, the greatest Marvel villain, many would argue. Psh, greatest person, thing <laughs> ever in the history of cinema. Definitely, uh, Christopher Eccleston really <laughs> took on such an iconic role with so much gravitas. And fuck See, Doctor Who. <laughs> I would say, I would say Malekith took on Christopher Eccleston. Oh, it's like that Jim Carrey Man on the Moon yeah. documentary. Yeah, <laughs> <Malekith>. <laughs> uh, Well, before we go too much farther off topic, I think uh, our work here is done, Adam. Let's fly off into the sky. Adios.